Hello and welcome to the Welsh History Podcast. My name is Jonathan and today we're going to talk about a bit of a controversy. Uh, today many of us understand that Wales is a Celtic country. Of course that makes sense. It's in our DNA, we argue. The old language passed through centuries of old myths and traditions to the Celtic cultures of Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. As they say, it, it is self-evident. However, the term Celt is a loaded one in academic circles. A lot of very smart people bitterly disagree on this point, and today we're going to hammer down what is and what is not Celtic, and why is that such a big deal? More to the point, we are going to dip our toe in and make conclusions that likely will be completely out of date in 10 years' time. So be prepared, this will get very Doctor Who-ish this episode as we jump around a bit in history. In the early 1990s, archaeologists began to argue over how Iron Age Britain should be understood. The evidence of British history was one of consistency rather than fluidity. Looking back at our own recorded history, Britain's last invasion was almost a thousand years ago. Since then, no one from Queen Isabella to Napoleon to Adolf Hitler has successfully invaded and held Britain. More confusingly for the migration storyline, the DNA evidence points out that there is a consistency on whom our ancestors largely were. In other words, Grog and Ung of the Mesolithic era were largely the same people who became Anherid and Oain today. Genetically, the British ancestry has stayed largely static. However, there have been movements of elites into Britain in the past, and we can historically and archaeologically document these. First the Romans, then the Vikings, and finally the Normans made impacts on the landscape, the culture, and the genetics of the area. It is a fact that none of these groups wiped out the local populations. They just simply enforced their own way of life and their own leaders upon local populations. Very similar in a way to how the British invaded and held India and other places in Asia and Africa. This is also is what many feel have happened with the Anglo-Saxons and their incursion into Britain. And that pretty much is no matter what, Gildas says. So... What about the Celts? Well, this is where it all gets a bit shouty. Celtic identity rose into public consciousness with the Enlightenment. The idea that there was a Celtic race, which was an invader of Britain, and dominated Britain until new invaders crossed the Channel, became a very popular idea. One of the first to link Celtic identity to the so-called insular Celts of Britain, with a wider Celtic Europe, was a Breton cleric named Paul Yves Pezron, who wrote a book called Les Antiques de la Nation et de la Langue des Celtes in 1703. Pezron argued that the Celts were descendants of Noah who lived in Asia Minor and spread to Europe during ancient times, eventually spreading their ancestry into France and Britain, and their inheritors of the language and culture were the Welsh and the Bretons. Impressed with Pezron's conclusions, Edward Lloyd, a Welsh linguist who lived in Oxford at the time of the end of the 17th century and the beginning of the 18th, he was one of the first to identify the common roots of Welsh, Breton, and Cornish language. And he was very excited and very willing to speculate along where Pezron had started. In the Victorian period, however, around the time when... In the Victorian period, around the time as one of my professors called it, the unseemly scramble for Africa, occurred one of the great justifications for dominating other civilizations. It became the idea of the white man's burden, the idea that only the white men, and always white men, could civilize these, in quotes, savages from other lands, just as the mighty Anglo-Saxon had done in Britain. Part of the reason for this was the social application of the Darwin principle of the survival of the fittest, in this social Darwinism, which would lead to growth in this idea of social and racial domination, it was perceived as justifiable racism. We're just trying to help these poor, uneducated people, they would say. Eventually, a powerful offshoot of social Darwinism was the classification of other races, in quotes, which soon became thought of as possibly subhuman, 
and thus because of that, worthy of death. But before the Nazis came along, the Victorians were eager to show the natural dominance of the so-called English race. They started to champion the idea of the Anglo-Saxon Protestant way of life as the natural dominating force in the world because of their racial, natural, Aryan loveliness and work ethic. They were naturally born to rule, of course, especially over people who were lesser than them. So classifying the Celts as an inferior race was a natural outgrowth of this thinking, which needed the steady English hand to dominate them, as the Romans had had to do before. In fact, we see some of this commentary in Bede's writings back in the 8th century, when he described the, the British, as he called them, as being unruly and unwieldy and a very irreligious lot, which is why, you know, the, the Anglo-Saxons had to come along and straighten them out. And were the punishment, literally, by God. So, with that in mind, we have a poet who lived in the middle of the 19th century named Matthew Arnold, and here's what he said. Here, too, his want of sanity and steadfastness has kept the Celt back from the highest of success. If his rebellion against fact had thus lamed the Celt, even in spiritual work, how much more must it have lamed him in the world of business and politics? In other words, basically what his feeling was is that the Welsh and Irish and Scottish people were mostly very sensitive and very artsy, if you want to put it in a modern parlance, kind of the hipsters of the uh, Victorian era. And so thus they would never be as good as, you know, those hardworking Anglo-Saxon descendants from England. So with all that in place, it's strange to realize that it isn't long after that, that there's actually a Celtic revivalism in the 1880s and the early 1900s, which stole this idea about the Celts and actually described it as something to be laudable and worthy. Obviously, if if they're the sensitive artsy type, then the music and the poetry and everything great about Celtic mysticism and ritualism suddenly is in. So now we have the cool Celts and empires were out. So with all that in place, in the 1990s, backlash and the succeeding years of verbal confrontations in academic schools over the idea of Celtic Britain led, leads us back where we started. The reality of it is, normally if this happens at any other year, this doesn't become the issue it becomes, or any other decade even. In 1990s, we have the, the debates over devolution and the Celtic, in quotes, countries of Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales uh, trying to take back some of their government away from what was then the national government of the United Kingdom and try and create their own parliaments and assemblies and try and govern themselves, at least to some extent. This devolution, as it's called, comes up to vote in 1997. And so in the heat of all this, in comes the academics blundering in talking about whether or not there even was a Celt. And maybe none of these people existed, and that blows things up in a quite a dramatic way, as we'll see as we talk about this. So, to get started, we're going to talk about a few names. I just want to give you an idea that there are going to be a number of names of professors and such that will come up, uh, and you'll hopefully you can just keep up as we go, and if not, I have included some of them in my list, so you can read some of their arguments for yourself. Uh, one of the first is uh, Barry Cunliffe. He's a professor who writes about a lot of the perspective of Celts based on his ideas that the Celts had always been perceived to have moved in in the Iron Age. That's part of the reason why we're talking about this now. Uh, his argument is rather that the Celtic population moves into Britain not in that period of time, but in the Bronze Age and, and sooner than that possibly, that there's this movement out of the Iberian Peninsula into Ireland and from Gaul into England and what we now call Wales and Scotland from these areas. And this is where we get the Irish, or the Irish, sorry, this is where we get the idea of a Celtic population from, is from this group. And this is why there is some commonalities both across the sea and in, in Britain. On the other hand, uh, Simon James, a professor from, uh, Leicester University actually wrote a fairly scathing uh, article and then book. Uh, his book is called The Atlantic Celts, Ancient People or Modern Invention? 
and he argued you could lump, not lump all Celts in one mix across the present countries of Germany, France, Spain, and parts of Italy, and then add in Britain and Ireland. In fact, he argued there was little enough in common to create this vast Euro-ethnicity. His argument was is that there is no evidence that the Celtic populations came from where some had argued they'd come from. Historians and archaeologists of the past had argued that they had actually come out of an area around Switzerland and in southern Germany, but his point was is that the Celtic race at that point, or if you want to call it a Celtic race, actually seems to have originated more towards Spain, and in fact the geography that leads them to the Danube is actually a screw-up on the part of Herodotus, who doesn't understand the geography of the community he's talking about, and thus, even though he's saying they're in Spain, he thinks the Danube actually stops in Spain. But this led to a bunch of confusion later when people think, oh, well, the Celts obviously started near the Danube, whereas the point is is that they probably more likely started in the Spanish areas in, in what they called Celtic Iberia. So, as I said earlier, there's little difference between what Cunliffe and James are really saying. In other words, effectively, it's just a matter of when did you say they came here? For James... The British population comes actually in the Neolithic and Mesolithic era, and there's a lot of evidence for that, uh, and that there isn't an evidence of an, of a movement during the Iron Age of people into the, in, into Britain, or Ireland for that matter. And so he starts to pick away at this idea. Well, Professor Cunliffe is joined in at this stage by a writer named, uh, Peter Beresford Ellis, who's a, a writer in Ireland who who is of English origin, but but had come to Ireland and wrote for their paper uh, over there, and then had written several books. and And one of his books called The Celts, he actually tried to diffuse some of this argument against a concept of a Celtic people that lived in Britain, and in fact pointed out a f- number of sources where it showed the similarities. The biggest problem between James and the others is that James was arguing that there was a difference that just because the culture was similar, it didn't immediately mean that the actual racial ancestry was the same. And he had a point. Um, But I would argue that most of the professors at the time were probably agreeing with him at the end of the day. However, because he's saying this quite vigorously, and he's very active in this debate, and is very critical in this debate, uh, one of the problems is, is he gets a huge backlash against him over it. People were, in fact, calling for his death at one point. It's because he was denying that there had ever been a Celtic, in quotes, race. People were, uh, up in arms and he was kind of stoking the fire to some degree. And so for a while, that was quite, uh, social media of everyone. <laughs> if we were to put it in more modern internet terms, it was a bit of a bit of a bit of a storm that created a bit of an outrage. And and as I say, people lined up on either side and started bickering. And Ellis was actually a big one to argue against James. Went so far as to put articles in the paper, which James then responded to, which there was a counter response in some of the journals, and it just kept going on and rolling and rolling and rolling into a bigger and bigger thing. As we get out of this era of devolution and this argument over what is and what isn't a Celt, and most of the academic world goes back to being ignored for everybody, everybody in the academic world kind of went, well, at the end of the day, the Iron Age in Britain isn't exactly the same as the rest of Europe. Thus, it is arguable that there is no Iron Age movement, and thus there isn't an Iron Age Celtic group in Britain. Uh, and yet... There's enough similarities to this migration pattern that you can't say there wasn't movement out of Europe. Uh, Dr. Stephen Oppenheimer takes a bit of James's position, but it's much more nuanced. Uh, he argues that the origins of the Welsh and the English are actually different, but that the differences come in the Stone Age, that the Welsh actually originate out of closer to, again, going back to Spain, and he says that the English were from a, a more northern area and thus more influenced by Nordic and, and Germanic peoples coming again out of the Stone Age. So his argument is, is that these two separations existed, but they existed much earlier than what we talk about, which is quite an interesting idea. So again, going back to the question, 
was there an Iron Age Britain Celt? And the answer is we don't know. <laughs> um, we know that they shared language. We know that they shared culture with those in Gaul and in Iberian Spain, uh, that there was a shared trade and shared idea. You know, there's talk about Druids. And unfortunately, they didn't keep their own writing. So we don't know from themselves what they thought. Most of our perspective comes out of the Romans. So keeping that in mind, we get a very uh, biased view about what a Celt is and isn't. But one of the things that they talk about fairly commonly is the idea that people look like certain people. Julius Caesar described some of the uh, Southern English as looking like they came from from Belgium, uh, which was a Germanic area at the time. And then Tacitus described the Welsh as looking like they were from the Welsh tribes as looking like they were from Spain. So these ideas of that are then influenced on other people who are writing after the fact and kind of it, it influences the whole idea. Yet there are similarities culturally to these places. So if we think about it from the aspect of cultural transition or cultural transfer, then yes, you could say there was a Celtic Britain because Britain was influenced by the European trade market. It, no different in a way than if you found, let, let's put it into a modern perspective. Say you have someone who, who wore a Yankees cap and he was wearing it or she was wearing it in, say, Bombay, India. Now, let's say they lost it or something happened and that, that cap gets buried under a mound of dirt and a thousand years later, somebody who really doesn't know what a Yankees is or n only kind of knows what an America is and an India is finds this cap, now all of a sudden they've got to make an impression and an understanding based on what they think might have happened. So it's easy to say, well, obviously they, they took over that area and they migrated there. Whereas likely what happened is, is that this person just brought the hat over because they liked the hat. They made even themselves not even known what a Yankees was. Um, or maybe they barely knew or they sort of heard of it. I mean, I've run into that before where there are people who wore outfits of sports teams as examples who didn't follow the sports team but loved the colors that they had and could only barely tell you what the sport was uh, so it's not uncommon for these kind of cultural exchanges to happen and it, but in this case we also have a language exchange so much like how english has kind of become the lingua franca or how in Roman times, Latin was sort of the language that everybody ended up having to speak if they wanted to carry on business and, and be able to kind of meet with the government. Uh, you would have that same sort of thing with, with English. Well, similar things have happened in a way with the Celtic language, where there was a Celtic language and there's obvious similarities between what we find in Gaul, what we find in, in the Welsh languages, even before the separation of the two that there is some sort of commonality. Again, we just don't know clear enough at what point those languages split off and whether or not they just say relatively static. So that's one of the reasons why we discuss these things is because we don't know enough about it. So, so there's a lot of guesswork that goes on. And throughout any prehistory, there is guesswork. There is no doubt about that. So recent DNA evidence has also continued to conclude what uh, Stephen Oppenheimer has said. In fact, there is a recent study done of Welsh DNA and actually DNA across Britain in 2012. And in studying that DNA, again, it reinforced what Oppenheimer had said about the separation between the English and the Welsh, claiming that the Welsh, Western Welsh, especially the North and the South of West Wales, have DNA that goes back farther than the rest of Britain, meaning that they settled here first. Um, in fact, Professor Peter Donnelly from Oxford said to the BBC in 2012, people from Wales are genetically relatively distinct. They look different genetically from much of the rest of the mainland Britain. And actually, people in North Wales look relatively distinct from the people of South Wales. So the Welsh, the Cornish, the Irish all appear to have roots that go back into the Mesolithic period in Britain, but at the same time share a common ancestry which appears to have migrated, as we said earlier, from the southern parts of France and in Spain. Unlike other Britons who were more influenced by migrations and invasions that happened later. So if we go into this and talk about it sort of from my own personal perspective, where do I stand on the Celts? That's an interesting debate. And I think my comment is, is that 
Kelt is what you want to make it. If you want it to be you, if you want to say that you are a Celt because you're Irish or you're Welsh or you're Scottish or you're Breton or you're a Cornish person, I see no problem with that. Any more than I see a problem with somebody who, whose ancestry was Welsh or English or German who moves over to the United States and then his children claim that they're Welsh, German or whatever. There's no real difference in that respect. Even though that they're American, there's, they, they haven't changed the fact that they have this ancestry and that it means something to them. And it's something they want to keep special to them. So realistically, if you want to call yourself a Celt, if you want to call the area of so-called insular Britain a Celtic country, then more power to you. And I don't see what the big deal is. At one point in my life, when I was full of belief and conviction and absolute conviction about everything, I might have died on a hill of Celtic origins. In fact, I would say I can remember having, well, uh, a lot of discussions with myself, at least, about whether or not the whole like concept of the origins of the Anglo-Saxons made sense based on both the, his you know, why was the history so different from the archaeology? where the history describes a wiping out of one people, but archaeology tells us that, no, those people weren't wiped out. At most, they just merged into the culture that came in as an elite culture or a settler culture and combined with them. And maybe we can sort of understand better if we realize that there is some commonality in those groups. And so when you have the Saxon movements into Britain, the Germanic people who move into Britain at least to fill in space at one point and then intermarry and become a part of this new culture, then they, it makes some sense that they would carry over their thoughts and beliefs and all of these cultures would get stronger and then you would have an Anglo-Saxon culture that's very different from the, the culture of the Welsh, the culture of the Cornish and the culture of the Scottish and would confront each other because of that there's no arguing that there wasn't wars and and problems between them and massive battles and we'll talk about all that but the reality of it is we cannot say for sure and in fact there's a lot of archaeological evidence that argues against it that there was an anglo-saxon genocide that wiped out all of the britons that were living here and took up space in what we now call england it, it just didn't happen that way and much the same way, we can't say that the Celts migrated into Britain, exterminated the existing beaker population from the Bronze Age, and just took everything over. That's too simplistic. And we all know that the most simplistic way of describing things is usually wrong. And everything is not black and white. And on this particular issue especially, it is not black and white. And I think as we get a better understanding of where we are, and a better understanding of DNA. Because as I said earlier, I mean, in 10 years' time, this could all be different. 10 years ago, we all knew something, and that has been proved different. But you're always going to have people that are going to believe in what they th have built up for themselves. We're always going to have this argument, because at the end of the day, there's a lot of people who really do fundamentally feel that their life is based around this. And so if you're taking it away from them, you're taking away their culture, you're taking away their their ability to be who they are, in their opinion. And so what we want to do here from the Welsh History Podcast standpoint is say, archaeology tells us this, based on our academic understanding of archaeology, our academic understanding of the writings that would come later, we know that there was a separate group of people who called themselves after the various names that they had for themselves, who became called Britons by the Romans. They may or may not have been DNA-related Celts in an affiliation with the Celtic Iberians or the, the Gaulish Celts out of France. These people, however, weren't any less because of that. And it doesn't mean that they're not Celtic today any more than it meant that they were Celtic then. And I think if we all can accept and understand that and then move on, I don't think it's a big controversy. And I think that's, that's been the problem. I think the controversy is, is something of a political controversy rather than an actual academic controversy. I think both sides need to give the other a break. I mean, if somebody wants to talk about a Celtic tribe lived here, 
I don't think from an academic standpoint that's a problem. But for some people, they want to say Iron Age. No, this was an Iron Age settlement. We don't say Celts. So everybody has their point of view. Everybody has their own standpoint on this. And I think if we have the willingness to kind of let everybody have their own idea, we can then move on and actually talk about what's important. And we're getting into a lot of important stuff here. The Celts or the Iron Age Britons have huge ramifications on what comes later. They they will affect all of what we know as Britain for many millennia to come, because even as the Romans come in and then leave, the one of the first things that actually happens is we see that the Celtic populations that are left over, the Roman Britons, that suddenly go back to their old Iron Age ways. And why did they do that when that was like 500 years ago? You know, what was, what was the point of suddenly going back to the hill forts? You know, why did, why did they feel the need for that? Are there gods that they worshipped during the Roman era before Christianity comes to Britain that were actually worshipped in the Iron Age? That's one of the things we're going to examine and talk about because I think there is some evidence of that being the case. I think what we'll find is, is that Britain becomes just as heavily influenced by outside forces as inside forces. And the understanding that we'll have of what becomes the Welsh and what becomes the English and the Scottish and the Irish and even the Bretons will come out of the understanding that these people had a common beginning and that the controversy is not a controversy, but is rather a way to structure our understanding of where we came from and now where are we going. And so as we go into the Iron Age period and as I kind of flip back and forth between Celt and Iron Age person and Britain and blah, blah, just understand that it it is an issue for some people. It is a controversy for some people. And some people get very invested in this argument. And it's up to us to be sort of above that. And I'm hoping as listeners, you know, you're above getting worked up over it and understand that I personally don't see a problem with saying Celtic and I don't see a problem with saying Britain and I don't see a problem with saying Iron Age. So as we go, please, if you have comments, concerns, if you have anything you want to talk about, uh, I can certainly respond to you in a number of different ways. Uh, you can talk to me on Twitter at Welsh History Pod. Uh, you can talk to me via email at Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com. Or you can talk to me on Facebook at uh, facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. We are just scratching the table of, and just starting to enter into the first actual historical record of the British people. And I'm so excited to finally get into this era and actually start to talk about written evidence as well as the archaeological evidence. Because as much as it's nice to have the archaeological evidence, and it does give us a much better understanding of what people were like and what the day-to-day -day life was like, having the extra writing and understanding of people looking from an outside in, which is what we're going to start with, I think it's a very curious thing to understand. And as we talk about the Greeks who, who first sort of start to talk about Britain, and then you have the Romans who will spend a lot of time talking about Britain, we will come to a much better understanding of where the Welsh come to when the Romans finally leave and the British population is left to itself and what it means to be a Welsh person in that particular environment, and what it means to come into conflict with people who are also fighting for same similar territory, and how that will drive a lot of the problems and concerns, and how this whole thing will develop. But it all starts out with the Iron Age here coming up. We're going to talk about hill forts next time. I hope you'll join me, and thank you guys for all listening. And once again, if you can give us a rating and a review on iTunes and on Stitcher and on Google Play. Those really help us out. It helps other people find our podcast. If you would like to raise our banner on other things like social media, we would love that too. We are so happy with where we've gone so far. I, I cannot tell you how excited I am to be doing this project and how excited I am when I see the interest of other people and, and the delight of other people. And it's great to get feedback. And I continue to hope to hear from you all and uh, if there's anything you find that you think would be a good thing to contribute please do because it's not like I can read everything and, and not like I see everything so anything you send me I will definitely take my best shot at trying to read and understand 
and try and disseminate to everyone else. So hopefully we can all participate in this community together. And as we go, I look forward to continuing to tell, tell this story of the history of Wales. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more information, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.